I'm going to dedicate the remainder of this chapter to the similarities between Mein Kampf and the Koran, because I do not want the world to endure a third holocaust. The veil of religiosity must be removed from Islam, so that we might defend ourselves from its racial hatred and intolerance, its command to wipe the infidels out to the last. I know of no better way to accomplish this goal than to expose the similarities between Mohammed and Hitler, Islam and Nazism, the Islamic scriptures, and Mein Kampf. Before we dive back into the Nazi gospel, which I believe is simply an updated and more intelligible version of the Quran, consider these Nazi proclamations. The first was penned by Dr. Paul Joseph Goebbels in 1929. He confirmed that Hitler like Mohammed, was a messianic figure, that Nazism, like Islam, was intentionally veiled in religiosity. We believe that fate has chosen him to show the way to his people. Therefore we greet him in devotion and reverence, and can only wish that he may be preserved for us until his work is completed. Their Fuhrer works with the miracle of faith, enlightening our people like a meteor before their astonished eyes instilling in us a belief that eliminates despair. These stirring words are from Sontheimer in Munich, although they sound more like Muslims in Medina. Salvation can only come about through a leader selected and blessed by Providence, who can rescue his people from their plight, restore them, make them honest, and serve as the embodiment of their longing, the bearer of godly power and destiny, an organ of a power transcending him. As with the Islamic Pledge of Aqaba, Nazis pledge their loyalty. Friends, raise your right arm and cry out with me proudly, eager for the struggle and loyal unto death. Heil Hitler! Then, with religious symbolism oozing out of every pore, Goebbels introduced his apostle. The leader of a new, young Germany, der Führer, the prophet, the fighter, the last hope of the masses. Rudolf Hebb embodied the spirit of both movements when he wrote, The leader must be absolute in his propaganda, in his speeches and words. He must not weigh the pros and cons like an academic. He must never leave his listeners the freedom to think. The great popular leader is similar to the great founder of a religion. He must communicate to his listeners an apodictic faith. Only then can the masses be led where they should be led. They will then also follow the leader if setbacks are encountered, but only if he has communicated an unconditional belief in the absolute rightness of his cause. He was saying that Hitler was just like Mohammed. And Hebb's claims on behalf of his Fuhrer were similar to Allah's on behalf of his prophet. Ishak and Quran 2.23 the Apostle calls on you to tell the truth about which there is no doubt. And if you are in doubt about what we have sent down to him, or in doubt about what he says, then produce a surah like it, and summon witnesses other than Allah. But you will not, because you cannot, for the truth is beyond doubt. Apart from time and place, there is no appreciable difference between the founder of Islam and Nazism. Their polygious doctrines and their holy books are indistinguishable. They cannot coexist in a civilized world, because neither tolerates a rival. Mein Kampf 137 The movement has to avoid everything that could diminish or even weaken its ability to influence the masses. Perhaps not for demagogic reasons, but because without the enormous power of the masses, no great idea, no matter how lofty it may appear, is realizable. Islam says, Quran 9.29, Fight the people of the book, Christians and Jews, and those who do not believe in Allah, everybody else, until all of them pay the jizya protection tax in submission. Quran 9.123, O believers, fight the unbelievers around you and make them realize that you are unrelenting. Like Hitler, Muhammad was an equal opportunity hater. 
While his favorite enemy was Jews, he despised those who held the power he craved, as well as those whose view of life conflicted with his own, those pesky Christians. Mein Kampf 139 The Catholic clergy brutally infringes German rights. They side with the enemy because the head of the Catholic Church is not in Germany, a fact which contributes to their hostility. 140. Germany would gain enormously by a victory against the Church. Of Protestantism and Catholicism, Der Fuhrer wrote, Mein Kampf, 141. Both religions take an attitude toward the Jews that is counter to the concerns of the nation and the real needs of a religion. Hitler didn't bother demeaning Islam, the largest religion, because he recognized the Quran shared his demented view. It says, Quran 5 verse 51, Believers do not accept Jews and Christians as allies. They are allies of one another. Any one of you who befriends them is surely one of them. Ishak, the Jews were in a state of fear on account of our attack upon them. The prophet declared, Kill every Jew who falls into your hands. Mein Kampf, 414. Witness the Judah Varek May Jews Die outcry which our youth organizations have taken up. Projecting his faults on his enemy, Hitler impersonated Mohammed. Mein Kampf, 415. Jews are a pack of wolves whose appetite for booty only dissolves when the pack's hunger abates. They are united only by common booty or a common enemy. Otherwise, they are a horde of rats, fighting bloodily among themselves. If the Jews were left alone, they would suffocate in their own dirt and filth. Jews have a shame culture in which everything they possess is really the property of other peoples, and it is spoiled in their hands. Speaking of the same people, the Quran says, In Quran 3, verse 111, the people of the book will do no harm, but only annoy you, as they will turn their backs rather than fight. They are degraded and have earned the anger of Allah. Misery overhangs them. Quran 59, verse 14. They are a divided people, devoid of sense. Quran 4, 53. Sufficient for them is hell and a flaming fire. When their skin is burnt up and singed, we shall give them a new coat, that they may go on tasting the agony of punishment. Alas, Hitler could only burn them once. These men recognized that the easiest way to defame was to lie. Mein Kampf, 418 The Jew never possessed a state with a territorial boundary. 420 Jews live in other states as parasites disguised under the name of religion. The Jew is a master of lying. Everything they have is purloined or stolen. The Jew cannot be religious because he lacks idealism, and he does not believe in the hereafter. Remember what Madhudi said in his commentary on the anti-Semite surah? Consequently, their Jewish beliefs, morals, and conduct has gone to the lowest depths of degeneration. The pity is that they were not only satisfied with their condition, but loved to cling to it. Der Fuhrer explained why Der Prophet turned three distinctly different enemies into one, hating Meccans, then Jews, and Christians. He called them all pagans, unbelievers, infidels, and even friends of one another. Here's why. Mein Kampf, 152. The efficiency of the true national leader consists primarily in preventing the division of the attention of a people, always concentrating it on a single enemy. The fighting will be more uniform, the force will be greater, the cause more magnetic, and the blow more powerful. It is the part of the genius of a great leader to make adversaries in different fields appear as always belonging to one category. People are weak and unstable characters, and thus various enemies will lead to incipient doubts as to their own cause. As soon as the masses waver, due to confronting too many enemies, objectivity steps in, and the question is raised whether all others are wrong and their movement alone is right. This provides a brilliant insight into Muhammad's tactics. Mm -hmm. 